Jerry Lee Lewis was an American pianist, singer, and songwriter. Nicknamed the Killer, he was described as rock and roll's first great wild man. Jerry Lee Lewis always hoped that his music was what he would be remembered for. Given that he spent his life so close to the edge that he was usually dangling over it, it was always going to be tricky to separate the myths and legends of a man nicknamed the Killer from bare top 40 statistics. He considered himself a stylist, not just a musician, but a complete package, fully formed from his very first record. You are either hot or cold, he would say. If you are lukewarm, the Lord will spew you forth from his mouth. He would spend much of his life wrestling with his southern upbringing and his conscience. Torn between his piano and the pulpit, he had outlived two wives and two children by the time he was 60. Born in Faraday, Louisiana, Jerry Lee Lewis's family was very poor. When he first showed a keen interest in his uncle's piano at the age of eight, his father Elmo had to mortgage the family shack to buy Jerry Lee an upright Stark. The first song he mastered was Silent Night in a boogie woogie style. Musically, he was colorblind. Aged 14, he would sneak into a nightclub in the black part of Faraday called Haney's Big House, then hide behind the bar and hear people like B.B. King, Muddy Waters, and his favorite, Ray Charles. Like so many other Southern boys, he was blown away by Elvis Presley and spotted an opportunity. In late 1956, Elmo Lewis sold 33 dozen eggs and financed a trip to Memphis where Jerry Lee would successfully audition for Sam Phillips and Sun Records. The blend of R&B and country on his early Sun singles was just as powerful and as definitively Southern as Elvis Presley's. His piano sounded like it was going to break through the floorboards on his second single, the super sexual whole lot of shaking going on and the result was an international hit. He followed it up with an even bigger hit and UK number one, Great Balls of Fire, in early 1958. In spite of all the peaks and troughs that came later, Lewis remained mostly famous for the life he briefly led in 1957 and 1958, when he got to hang out on an MGM set with Elizabeth Taylor, of which he said, I ain't never seen a woman that beautiful in my life and leave Liberace speechless, he couldn't believe anyone, not even Jerry Lee Lewis, could play piano that fast, that well, and sing at the same time. Liberace thought there had to be another piano hidden in the wings. Of course, it didn't last. After his British tour was abandoned in 1958, after the tabloids revealed he had married his underage cousin Myra, and after he told the American press that this didn't really matter, that thousands stood and cheered in London, that there was nothing to apologize for, Lewis was effectively boycotted by TV, radio, and concert promoters. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to remember this if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content. The quality of his records hardly wavered. 1959's Love and Up a Storm was as breathless as the title suggested, but it now failed to even make the Billboard Hot 100 in the US. Britain, maybe feeling a little guilty, continued to buy his singles, and a version of Ray Charles's What Did I Say saw him back in the top 10 in 1961. Lewis carried on producing singles for Sam Phillips' son, and London kept releasing them in the UK, right up to 1965. He was the last of the big names, Elvis, Roy Orbison, Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash, to leave Sun, and when he did, the label effectively ceased to exist. Some were great, some adding an attempt of modernity, I've been twisting in 1962, some just seemed to wish it could be 1958 all over again, with What Did I Say, Sweet Little Sixteen, and Good Golly, Miss Molly. Lewis was only 29 when the Beatles stormed America, but must have seemed and probably felt much older. Worse yet, Little Richard, Chuck Berry and Carl Perkins would soon start to receive fat checks thanks to the Merseybeat revivals of their gilded catalogues. 
Lewis had never really been a songwriter, and the paucity of his catalogue must have struck him as his contemporaries finally got their financial dues. To reignite his career, he returned to Britain, scene of his downfall, and tore it up in Glasgow, Manchester, and Newcastle. He also played West Ham, West Bromwich, Harrow, Hereford, and Swaddling Coat. The kind of mayhem he may have inflicted on Swaddling Coat was captured in a Granada TV studio in April 1964, where he was filmed for an extraordinary one-off show called Whole Lot of Shaking Going On. Thoroughly involved, Lewis looks possessed as he hammers through his current single, I'm On Fire. The cameras are fighting to catch a glimpse of him as the audience are climbing scaffolding, swarming the stage, and bash the side of his piano with their fists. They throw their hands up in the air like it's a southern revival meeting when Lewis plays the piano with his foot. They are inches away from him, their faces a picture of total abandon, unconfined joy. A week later, backed by Weybridge band The Nashville Teens, he cut the 37-minute Live at the Star Club Hamburg album, raucous, thrilling, and unbelievably fast. Get it right, boy, growls Lewis at one point to a presumably terrified teen. It remains the greatest live rock and roll album bar none. Back home, people still packed out his live shows. At one in Arkansas, the young Bill Clinton queued to get the killer's autograph. But record sales kept sinking. The mid-60s were lost years for Jerry Lee Lewis, dotted with odd gems like Shotgun Man, It's a Hang Up Baby, and I Believe in You all of which touched on the country rock soul hybrid Charlie Rich mastered on his 1965 hit Mohair Sam. The difference was that Mohair Sam was a top 30 hit for Rich, but nothing would sell for Jerry Lee Lewis. Country was still seen as largely conservative music in the mid-60s, but attitudes would soon change as psychedelia waned. Lewis's contract with the Smash label was about to expire in 1968, so cutting a new Nashville song called Another Place, Another Time was a last throw of the dice. It quickly picked up airplay and would become the first of 11 consecutive top 10 hits on the country chart. Finally, after 10 years, America had forgiven Jerry Lee Lewis. This was straight ahead country for Southern folks with hard bitten lyrics sung for adults from an adult perspective. Now signed to Mercury, a string of hugely successful country albums followed. As a barstool balladeer, Jerry Lee Lewis could sell out the International in Las Vegas in 1970. The heroism of his early days was reborn in stoical, heartbreaking songs like She Even Woke Me Up to Say Goodbye. Of course, Nashville couldn't contain him. Lewis's boozing, pill-popping and womanizing caught up with him when Myra filed for divorce in 1970. He sobered up for a few months, recorded a religious album called In Loving Memories, and kept his marriage together for a while, but the death of his mother triggered a lost weekend in April 1971, which ended in a drink-driving arrest. The clearly autobiographical and heartfelt Would You Take Another Chance On Me gave him another country number one hit at the end of 1971, but his infamous marriage was over after 14 years. None of these country hits meant much in Europe, where his legend was still based entirely on his late 50s hits. Lewis had two parallel careers. In 1972, he headlined the London Rock and Roll Show at Wembley Stadium, a remake of the Big Boppers' Chantilly Lace even gave him a minor UK hit that year. In 1973, he recorded The Session, a double album with Albert Lee, Alvin Lee and Rory Gallagher that worked for both rock and country markets. But the same year, his son Jerry Lee Jr. died when his Jeep overturned and Lewis hit a new low, depressed and drinking more than ever. The country hits began to falter and worse was to come when the taxman raided his home in 1979. He described the IRS as silly for seizing his pianos, his clothes and even his young son's toys. But what really upset him was that they seized the stark piano his parents had bought him when he was 8 years old, its ivories now worn through. 
He toured Australia in 1979 and appeared absolutely plastered on TV with chat show host Don Lane. I don't like to be called the killer, he said, looking a little sad, even though I am the killer. Barely coherent, he was still capable of turning and a barnstorming great balls of fire. I'm not a wild person, he told Lane. I am a very gentle man. People talk, do a lot of crying, do a lot of dying, but Jerry Lee Lewis is still here. His significant recordings were now behind him, but for the rest of his life he could always pull a crowd and always share a stage with Johnny Cash or Bruce Springsteen or Keith Richards. When Dennis Quaid played him as a wild-eyed loon in the 1989 biopic Great Balls of Fire, Lewis said, I just thought it was bad. It just wasn't right. It wasn't Jerry Lee Lewis. Basically, it wasn't about the music. The soundtrack album sold a million copies and became his all-time bestseller. Though there would be more near-death situations, more run-ins with the IRS, more issues with the state of his liver and his finances, he would always remain a stylist. When they look back on me, I want them to remember me, not for all my wives, although I've had a few, and certainly not for any mansions or high living money I made and spent. I want them to remember me simply for my music. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you have a favorite Jerry Lee Lewis song that you like the most or perhaps a moment in his career that you remember the most? Let us know in the comments below and if you haven't already done so, click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content.